Well, that's a great introduction, and I heard since I come to University of Chicago many stories, but I think Dali is the most persuasive, <laughs> at least for Chinese audience. Um, uh, I want to uh, discuss some of the very important Jurassic fossils from China. Okay, so before I start, uh, I will just point out that uh, modern mammals. Uh, are defined by human beings on one side, and uh, this monotreme I'm holding a uh, echidna. So in 2008, I was doing field work, so I decided I'm going to make a connection with our most distant living relatives, and that's this echidna. So I hold it up for a picture, and I feel so gratified thinking about 165 million years of history between this guy and myself, okay? Uh, but uh, the mammal histories goes a lot longer than most people normally realize, okay? Um, we have uh, Cenozoic, that's age of mammals, also known as tertiary, that began at 65 million years, but the uh, Mesozoic started in 245 million years ago, there are three periods. We have Triassic, we have Jurassic, and then we have Cretaceous, okay? What we broadly define as mammals, anatomically recognizable by modern standards with modern live functions that can be traced in the fossil record uh, known as mammals, started about at the same time as dinosaurs. So from the get-go, when dinosaurs originated from their lineage, and mammals originated from our own lineage, we had arms raised, and uh, for much of this time, uh, dinosaurs dominated the terrestrial ecosystem. They are the rulers on the land, but mammals hang on eventually after dinosaur was wiped out by mass extinction, mammals continued on to become us, okay? Basically, if you reflect my holding this echidna, if something goes wrong in all these years, our lineage get wiped out, there wouldn't be you sitting there or me talking, right? Okay. Well, I get this question a lot. Why there are so many fossils in China? China is the world's third largest land surface by country, okay? China, by accident, is also in a temperate zone, so we have relatively less vegetation coverage. As a result of it, we have a lot of exposed land surface. Essentially, larger the fossiliferous rocks exposed on the surface, you have more chances for finding fossils. Okay, um, but I cannot talk about everything. I will just deal with two major fossil sites, and uh, the first of this is from uh, uh, Lu Feng Pendi, the Lu Feng Basin of Yunnan Province. Okay, and this is a picture of that, and with dinosaur bones in the foreground, roughly, there are about the site is about 150 kilometers west of Kunming. And uh, for this particular site, there is rather early history with the University of Chicago, okay? In the spirit of Dali's introduction, I'll talk about a few things. Now, the site was discovered by a very important Chinese paleontologist, C.C. Yang, Yang Zhongjie. And uh, in 1938, when Japan invaded Beijing, the China National Geological Survey had to evacuate, and so these guys had to hold out in Yunnan, and then they did something in their profession, and C.C. Young discovered the site. <clears throat> but there was a University of Chicago graduate, he received a PhD in geology, studied fossil vertebrates, and because he's also affiliated with Catholic Church, he eventually became the rector of Catholic University of Beijing for a long time, for about 
good seven or eight years. But uh, it was during this time he uh, organized the expedition and he collected a whole bunch of fossils. And the, some of these fossils was shipped to the Field Museum of Chicago on the Lakeshore Drive. And this collection of fossils, when China was completely close to the Western world between 1949 up to about 1976, 77, these are the only fossil from this important site that are accessible to the larger scientific community outside China. So it received a great bit of study. And uh, <clears throat> Harold Rigney was a PhD student with E.C. Olsen. And Olsen eventually studied a part of this fossil. And uh, he named it Sinocodon. Okay, Sino means China, Codon means cusp. So essentially, what I study is really in the footsteps of these great pioneers, some of whom preceded me 60, 70, 80 years ago. Okay, and somehow they have the wisdom to go to explore, to make the discovery, the fossil they collected to this day still benefit my own research. And through this kind of research to the larger body of knowledge that we all share as a scientific intellectual community. Okay? So that's the first site. The other site is from northeastern China. And this northeastern China has fairly extensive rock exposure in western part of the Liaoning and also in parts of Inner Mongolia and also in the northern part of the Hebei province. And uh, the sites are very important in producing many fossil birds and also the feathered dinosaurs. Okay, and that's the famous uh, stuff. But before this major episode of discovery of feathered dinosaur started from 1995 up to present, still going on very strong, in the late 80s, there was this fossil bird known as Cynornis, okay? And this is the initial study of Cynornis. Guess what? It happened with Paul Serino, a very well-known professor on the University of Chicago campus. And the fossil was discovered by a peasant, acquired by Beijing Museum of Natural History near Tiantan. And then a young student, uh, Zhao Chenggang, who was uh, a research scientist there, proposed that he would come to University of Chicago to study it with Paul Serino. And here is the useful Paul Serino, still somewhat wet behind his years as the first year assistant professor. I think he got to the campus on 1987, and the Chicago system was the first year or so you are a lecturer. And then you entered as a former tenure track assistant professor and here is Paul holding up a reconstruction photograph with Zhao Chenggang at the university, okay? But Paul has done many more things, okay? At almost 20 years later, Paul came back and in this fossil site, and he and his team uh, studied this very important fossil, Brachorosaurus, Sorex, okay? Which is on exhibit right next to him. That's not a replica, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the, the original has already been That's returned right. to China. That's right. right. Okay. But Paul is more than that, and Paul studied uh, in uh, many parts of Inner Mongolia, and Serino's work since his graduate student days was always sponsored by a very active Chinese dinosaur paleontologist, uh, Zhao Xijing. Okay, and here is Paul working with Zhao in the field. I, I believe this photo is taken sometime around 2001, 2002, 2003. And the Serino also went, went with Zhao Xijing to Tibet, okay, and the eastern part of Tibet. It's my understanding they still have some fossils. And Paul also worked in Gansu province, some of the same sites where I have been. And most recently, he started to uh, explore Shandong province, uh, although the work is still ongoing. But it's more than Paul Serino, my other colleague, uh, Neil Shubin, who has his famous book, Your Inner Fish, 
that really uh, uh, gained worldwide popularity. And Neil Shuming worked with Gao Keqing at uh, Beijing University, studied some of the world's earliest salamanders. You know, if you are in northeastern U.S., every creek, every shallow water body you go to, there are some salamanders. They are relatively rare in China, but are common in the south, southwest. But the salamanders are incredibly important animal group in the modern ecosystem. So to understand their earliest evolutionary history is a big deal, okay? So it attracts people like Neil Shubin, so on, to study. And then I want to take a different turn. There is an anecdote, okay? Um, in China, very early on, in fact, in the history book, dated to about 700 AD, there are already recording of fossils, okay? From get go, when fossils were recognized in the Chinese pop culture, it's always given this mythical proportion and it's known as dragon bones because China worship uh, the totem and dragon. Okay? So in 2000, the University of Chicago Press uh, published a book, okay? and this book was a series of original research paper re-edited, <laughs> synthesized by Nature's senior editor, uh, uh, Henry G. Okay, and University of Chicago published this book. And the title of this book is Rise of the Dragon, and here is the inscription of the title. And uh, the person who inscribed it for UC Press happens to be the president of People's Republic of China. Okay? Now, uh, a lot of academics in Chinese uh, tradition really abhor this getting too close to the power that be, or you are too smitten by pop culture and so on. Political figures do not validate science. Okay? But uh, nonetheless, the token that uh, it does have a bit of a uh, popular following in China. My own work started by restudying some of the very important fossils from uh, Yunnan as a postdoctoral fellow. Okay. And this is a Sinocodon rignii, the University of Chicago alumnus who used to be the rector of Beijing Catholic University. Okay. And here is Sinocodon. Okay. And, um, we also have the great luck to, to have studied this very important fossil called hydrocodium, which we published in 2001. And it's a tiny little fossil holding in my hand. And it's actually smaller than my thumbnail. But uh, I want to claim to you, hear me out, this is a leading proof that you don't have to be a great T-Rex in order to be significant, right? So like the short Chinese guy, we can always play that. Okay. Um, the other major fossils that we have studied are from the northeastern Chinese side. For example, we have this uh, a semi-aquatic mammal, and then we have one of the early relatives of modern Eutherian mammals. Okay. Well, now here is my seriously my my real talk. Okay. And the, way, the reason we're interested in this is uh, modern mammals are very diverse, and we want to understand where they are from, okay? And uh, modern mammals have 5,400 species, okay? And uh, have roughly about 1,000 genera, okay? And uh, all these mammals have one characteristic. We're all characterized by the female members of our species, of each mammal species, can provide lactation for our fetuses. Okay. But mammals are also important because of our 4,000 or so fossil genera, and this incredible fossil record gave all the academics a good reason to study them. Okay. And uh, mammals, the first group of modern mammals, are known as monotremes, and the monotreme actually lay eggs. Okay, in Chinese, it's called okay? uh, This monotreme has five species. Okay, 
in contrast with in contrast to the egg-laying mammals, we have live birth mammals, and these are known as felines. Okay, the first group of felian mammals are uh, marsupials. They all have pouch. Okay, the reason they have pouch is they have very short gestation, relatively premature birth, therefore very long nursing in the pouch. Therefore, most of the marsupial species have a pouch for their fetuses. But marsupials do have a placenta. It's just that their placenta is not as well integrated into the uterus. But this is the case with modern placental mammals. Okay? And modern placental mammals have more elaborate placenta. As a result of it, a much longer gestation. And when fetuses are born, are far more mature. It turns out this reproduction or mode of reproduction is so fundamental to our modern mammalian biology. Essentially, some 5,300 species of modern mammal, you name it, the cows, the tigers, the pangolins, the whales, primates, are all placental mammals. Okay, to understand the origin of placental mammals is very important. But what is uh, reproductive pattern are correlated with some features in the teeth and in the bones because the teeth and the bones can fossilize and uh, paleontologists normally go by fossilized teeth and bones to study them. Okay. Now given this reproductive diversity and I want to ask a very simple question what makes an animal? Okay. Superficially Mammals characterized by mammary glands, and mammals also have first, and first is a very important organ to keep the endothermic physiology for our body. Associated with the fur, we also have very sensitive tactile sense. Associated with the fur, the glands of the fur, we also have our mammary glands. Okay, so with fur we have uh, a very important biological uh, adaptation. But I'm a paleontologist. Unless something fossilized, it's kind of useless for me, okay? So let's look at some of the uh, bones and the teeth, dental structures. Mammals are characterized by a special jaw hinge. So when you chew, you put one, your finger one centimeter in front of your ear hole, and you move your jaw, you feel the joint, and that's a very important biological feature. Mammals also have this two generation of dental replacements. That is, we have a milk dentition, we have a baby teeth, and then we have a second generation called uh, the permanent dentition. And uh, this is possible because early on, we our fetuses can grow with benefit of mother's lactation. So we don't need the teeth. And also because under mother's lactation would grow very fast, we had to stop somehow. So when this growth start to stop, called determinant growth, our dental replacement would stop. So it's primarily impacted by lactation. We have a new growth pattern that gave us this limited dental replacement. This is something we can actually study with a fossil like Simacona now, okay? So I'll show you how. Of course, mammals have very sensitive ears. Mammals have a uh, very uh, elaborate nose, and mammals also have larger brain. Bigger brain is uh, a no-brainer. That's very important for us to understand, right? Okay, so let's trace some of the basic evolutionary history uh, marsupials and the placentals started about 160 million years ago, okay? And uh, our modern mammal group, common ancestor, can be traced back to 165 million, and is bracketed by human beings on one side, monotremes on the other, okay? But these modern mammals have a whole series of look-like relatives, and these are called mammalia forms, and this fossil has very interesting names, Cynoconodon, Morganodon, Megaconus, 
Casper Ricotta, and so on and so forth, their fossil record goes back to 220 p. Okay. Now, this particular group is nested inside yet another uh, evolutionary lineage called Cynodons, whose earliest member goes back to 250 million years. And this Cynodon are part of the mammal-like reptile group called Cynapsids. Their earliest record goes to 210 million years. Essentially, this genealogical relationship established by comparative morphology and the modern group's case, also by molecular sequences, have very good concordance with the geological sequence. And this gave us the confidence that we have a reliable, relatively reliable, and informative system to study mammalian evolution. So my name of the game is to pick somebody from this level of genealogical tree and to compare them to our modern mammals and map their features through all this green clades and get an understanding how we get from the condition of 240 million years ago to the modern day, all right? And this is why these fossils are important for us, because without those, we would lose this roadmap how the mammalian evolution get one step at a time from 310 million years ago to the modern day. So Jurassic, Jurassic mothers matters to us because they inform us about how we come about. I have a water here. Yeah. Okay. Now the first guy I'm going to introduce you to is this guy called uh, Castorocorda. Okay. And this Castorocorda has very interesting features. Okay. And it's from Middle Jurassic. It's from uh, Ningcheng of Inner Mongolia from Middle Jurassic site and uh, it was initially discovered in 2003 and it was published by my co-author and me in 2006 and the Castro Corda had one very interesting thing okay if you blow up on the tail you can see the scale okay and if you take even closer look you see the hairs come out of the uh, in between the scales and then we have, um, if you look at the tail vertebra, there are this H-shaped vertebra, and normally they are either in modern otters, which is a semi-aquatic form, or they are in modern beavers, which is modern rodent that actually swim uh, in a lake and build a little dam. And this species has worldwide distribution, okay? So, because we got this scaly broad tail, we got this very interesting, typical semi-aquatic mammals, vertebra, and, uh, you know, interesting enough, their teeth also have this sharp spike consistent with a feeding adaptation to eat fish. Okay, so we reconstructed as uh, the world's first known semi-aquatic mammal and then made the cover of science, okay? Well, people will say it's a beaver-like mammal. I would say modern beavers are like my Casper Corda <laughs> because this guy comes first, okay? And uh, in a more recent time, we have additional uh, study of a, uh, a proto-mammal called Megaconus, which, by the way, will come out in nature two days later, okay? this Thursday, okay. Um, this is also from the same Daofugo site, and they get a sense that these are the birds, okay. And so we made the skeletal reconstruction. Here is our, uh, uh, the reconstruction by my artist, uh, April Ish at the University of Chicago, okay. But uh, the importance of this is more than, you know, you have a cute semi-aquatic mammal. The important thing is uh, this, fossils are placed in the evolutionary lineage before the rise of modern mammals. And we always tend to associate with first the endothermic 
uh, metabolism associated with fur as a modern mammal feature, but in fact, in the evolutionary history, it can go much further back. That's why I'm interested in it. Okay, so by looking at this Jurassic fossil, it gave us this very interesting insight. Now, I want to switch the gear to talk about how we understand how lactation originated in the geological history, in our lineage, okay? We have uh, this uh, uh, distant relative called uh, Pachygenesis, okay? And uh, it has been to replacement. It'll replace very frequently, and it also replace at alternating positions. See, this, 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 this are in one generation, and this blue teeth is from another, and then the successor teeth is from yet another generation. So we have multiple replacement replacing at alternating site, okay? But if you look at modern mammals, here is uh, a, a baby jaw of the Australian dingo. It's a dog or a wild dog, okay? We have two generations of teeth. The DPs are deciduous or milk dentition, and then we have a permanent dentition. But uh, when the teeth are replaced in the front part of our jaw, it goes sequential. It has a single generation of replacement contrast to multiple generation of replacement of our distant reptilian relatives. It goes sequentially in contrast to alternating. You know, these are very simple ideas. If you get the fossil, you should be able to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I encourage some of you, should you be interested in science, maybe you're looking at my part of science and study fossils, okay? And we want to understand how we get from here to here, okay? The reason we are interested in it is more than just the dental replacement because of the ties to this very important mammalian reproductive strategy and growth pattern. And that is, this replacement is tied to determinant skull growth and also lactation. Okay, I'll explain why. Let me back step a little bit. <coughs> what we call determinant growth. Okay, I'm first using an example of birds and dinosaurs. Okay. We all know that the baby chicks can grow very quick, and then for the rest of their life, once the skull becomes fused, the bone suture joined with one another, the size of the body will stay at a plateau. We call it adult body size plateau, okay? So there's a rapid growth, and then level off is called determinant growth. In contrast to determinant growth, for crocodile, crocodile grow slowly early on, but never quite stop until they're at the end of their life, okay? So these two modes of uh, growth pattern is different, okay? Let me give you one more example, okay? And uh, here is a rodent, a mammal, okay? A mammal can grow really fast early on and then level off, whereas a crocodile, but by and large, the vast majority of reptiles all have the slow going, uh, uh, gradually growing body size, but it never quite stops until the day it dies. Okay. And this is determinate growth, and this is indeterminate growth. Okay. Let me show you some real data. And each of these dots is the growth curve along some, uh, for some very small mammals. Okay. And this is 100% of the adult body size, and these are the estimated day of conception. Okay, you get a sense that uh, for some small mammals, 45 days, they reach a full adult body size, and then they can live on for about two, possibly even three years. For rest, this growth plateau is completely level. Okay, so that's what it looks like. The reason mammals are able to do this at all is early on we benefit from mother's milk. This mother's milk nourish our growth so fast, so well, we set up this growth 
trajectory really steeply, okay? And then since we grow so fast, we have to level off somehow, okay? Well, the dental replacement pattern is profoundly changed because we have this early benefit of mother's milk. In a sense, early on we get to grow very fast without uh, teeth, thanks to mother's lactation. And then we have early termination because our skull can no longer grow. So everything else being equal, mammals have a shorter time of their longevity to replace the teeth with, therefore we have limited to replace them. All right, okay. We cannot document lactation in fossil record, but we can document the teeth that are the byproduct of lactation, okay. Now here is why cytochrome matters, okay. So we do the uh, fancy stuff and we can extract some very detailed information for its anatomy, okay? But uh, if you look at uh, what we know, this is one of the youngest uh, known individual cyanoconodon. This is one of the oldest individual cyanoconodon. And uh, this is the direction of ontogeny. If you map out the tooth replacement of the canine, you can see we have Two generation, second generation replacement. Definitely here, that's a third generation of replacement. And then we have fourth generation of replacement. And then we have fifth generation of replacement. That is, the front part of the teeth is entirely reptilian. Okay? And uh, one of them, uh, what's also very interesting is uh, when this guy is continuously replacing their canine, they also sustain a very slow skull growth. Okay, the next slide will help you to show it, okay? And uh, the smallest cyanoconodon we know is uh, roughly about 13 grams. So it's baby, bona fide. And, uh, but uh, the largest cyanoconodon we estimate the body mass is about, uh, half kilo, okay? And uh, by the fossil sequence, we can document some uh, 40 fold of body mass increase while the front teeth are continuously replaced. But in contrast to the other major mammal called Morganubidon from the same lower Lufon formation, Morganubidon has a very narrow growth range. And that is, uh, but, but, but also very important is Morganubidon. By CT scan, we know it has a typical modern mammal-like two generation of replacement in contrast to Cyanoconodon that has multiple generation of replacement. So what does this mean? Okay. It essentially means that uh, from the transition of Cyanoconodon into Morganubidon, we stopped this reptilian-like tooth replacement, and in Morganucodon, we start to have true two-generation replacement, determinant skull growth, no replacement of molars. Essentially, we can bet that Morganucodon already had lactation. So it's really through this tracing the fossil record we get to establish this, okay? So next time, uh, when you go to the dentist office, you have to reflect on this and you tell a story to your dentist, right? You go to see the dentist and they put all these gadgets in your mouth. They do the fancy work. And a lot of times it's uncomfortable, occasionally it even hurts, right? And when it's all done, you get to protect the one permanent generation of teeth for the rest of your life, right? You can tell the dentist that, you know, it's really thanks to evolution take a very interesting turn that I end up with this two generation of replacement. So I get to suffer and you have a job, <laughs> right? Okay, essentially this is such a fundamental part of our biological function, we have to take care of it, right? So that's one uh, study, okay? The other study we have is uh, this, uh, uh, 
Hagu literally means fool, Cody means head, and the, the Chinese translation is Ju So. Okay, I see a lot of Chinese faces here. I think you can all recognize that character. Okay, it's a tiny little animal, but uh, it has a lot of anatomical details. And uh, what we can do is we can make a reconstruction of its a brain endocast. We cannot have the brain tissue, but at least we can have the shape of the brain, and that can tell us something, okay? And one of the most important things it tells us is the big, and this encephalization quotient is a standard index after correction for body mass, and you can tell that uh, hydrocodium from about 195 million years ago has just as big a brain, or even bigger a brain, than the modern uh, apostle, okay? And this is how we do it, okay? So here is a skull of hydrocodium, and uh, we can strip it apart, and we can identify the internal anatomy to some extent, and then we use this uh, computer uh, graphics to figure out the brain endocast, and on this brain endocast, we can recognize the big brain hemisphere, we can recognize the olfactory region, and we can recognize the smaller brain, and we can recognize roughly the midbrain. It's very crude, but nonetheless, from 165, uh, 195 million years ago, it's okay for me, right? Well, <clears throat> The mammal brain has several components, okay? We have a small brain, and that's called cerebellar hemisphere. And then we have a large, uh, in front we have an olfactory bulb. This is responsible for smelling. And in between, we have large brain hemisphere and called a uh, cerebral hemisphere. And this structure really come about in the fossil record as we can best tell in an incremental way, okay? Now let's do the same thing <coughs> to compare a modern mammal with a distant mammal-like reptile relative that lived in late Triassic 250 million years ago, okay? The first thing we can tell is Modern mammals have very distinctive olfactory bulbs. And the smelling part of our brain is very, very prominent. And we can also tell modern mammals have a cerebral hemisphere. And we can also tell modern mammals have cerebellar or small brain hemisphere. And uh, above all, if you look at this guy, it almost shaped like a tube. The brain is tiny, but for us, we have a more curve in every direction. Essentially, we have expansion of multiple structures. And we also have much larger size, okay? So the question with fossil we can help to frame and discuss is really how we manage to get from here to here, right? So I hope it makes sense. And some of you are not scientists, right? So hopefully you can still follow me one step at a time. And so we map this anatomical features on this brain endocast over this evolutionary tree, and we can first document that uh, the divergence of our cerebral hemisphere of our big brain. Early on started with some of this mammalia forms. Okay? And then we can clearly tell brain is further differentiated in some of the Mesozoic mammals. And then by the time we get to modern theories, the game is almost over. The only thing we have added on that we can recognize in the fossil endocast are this cerebellar hemisphere. Now this brain hemisphere, large brain hemisphere is very important for us. And the sizable structure in those big brain hemisphere are this neocortex, which is the new tissue that's responsible for sensory touch. And the sensory touch directly comes from 
a series of receptor organs associated with the root of our hair. Okay, you perhaps are familiar with this diagram, right? And if you slice the comparable portion of the human brain around here, we have tremendous coverage on our hand, fair amount of coverage on our uh, uh, face, and some of it on our oral organ. Essentially, that size of that area gave us the sensitivity in response to the sensory detection from our skin. Okay? Now here is uh, at Morgan Bukadon, and this particular fossil is actually in the collection of IEPP, and also additional fossil from Beijing Museum of Natural History, and these are our CT reconstruction from the fossil always bring endocast and uh, look at what area they have and they are all enlarging in the area in modern mammals the brain surface responsible for detecting the sensory touch from the skin which is fundamentally tied to our hairs our skin gland and the sensory receptor associated with our hairs If we map it on the evolutionary tree, and this is the pattern we have, okay, and uh, with this early mammalia forms, we start to have very large olfactory bulb. We have extensive neocortex of the larger brain responsible for very sensitive sensory tactile sensory perception, which happen to be corroborated by the fossil record that the same mammals start to have the earliest known fur as preserved in fossils. So this corroborates that, okay? And then we have further enlargement of the brain that in some of these early Jurassic mammals, we already have modern level of brain size, and then we have additional correlation with uh, olfactory uh, bulbs, okay? So essentially, we with this fossil are able to tease apart this fairly seemingly complex evolutionary process in incremental steps. That's what I do for life, and that's what the University of Chicago pays for me to do it. Okay. And then we have, uh, let's shift the gear to northeastern China, and we have this particular fossil. It's one of the earliest uh, known relative to a uh, placental mammal lineage called uh, Juramaya, and this is a Chinese translation, okay? And uh, if we move to slightly younger stratigraphic level in early Cretaceous, and we have, a, uh, uh, we have Eomaya, and we have Sinodelphus, and this respectively re representing earliest known extinct relative to the marsupial lineage and extinct relative to placental lineage. Okay. And these fossils are very important for us. I'll tell you why. Okay. Modern mammals are divided into this uh, placentals on one side, marsupials on the other. Okay. And uh, these guys are all united together in a live birds group called the theory mammals. In addition to live birds, they are also characterized by a whole series of, of osteological features. Okay? And that this live birds mammal is in turn a part of mammalia as a whole, characterized by mammary clans. But uh, fortunately for paleontologists, in addition to this reproductive modes, we also have very specialized tooth features, skeletal features, so on and so forth, that permit us to recognize a certain fossil as to belong to which of the lineages. Okay? We do not have fossilized mammary glands or, or, or fetus in uterus, so on and so forth, but we do have a bone and the teeth as characters. Okay? Suppose if we have a fossil that's osteologically and also by dental comparison closer to modern human beings than to modern koala, we would place it in this part of the tree and we call them uh, eutherians, related to placentals but not quite inside placentals. Okay? And 
if we happen to have a fossil by compare its osteology and teeth closer to modern koala than to modern human beings, we would place them along this side of the tree. We would call them metatherians, meaning they're associated with modern marsupials, but not yet possible to place the inside modern marsupials as yet. Look close, but not quite complete. But this fossils gave us two critical pieces of information. One is, by fossil record, minimally how this placental can go down. And on the other side, this provides us with information what the ancestor of placentals and the marsupials could look like. We can do wild guesses, but uh, the guesses consistent with the fossil record is a lot more scientific than just wild guesses, right? All right, so, and then we have uh, this mammalian form that gave us the fundamental information to contrast the ancestor of mammals with the modern mammals, okay? So uh, about 30 years ago, uh, paleontologists worldwide are, are studying fossils roughly from this geological interval, okay, that's roughly upper part of the Cretaceous, okay? About 10 years ago, a whole series of discoveries from the Yixian Formation of China pushed the geological record to this level, about 125 million. And now we have pushed it down to uh, this late Jurassic level with the discovery of Jurimite. So time-wise, we consistently push forward when our lineages are first discovered in the fossil record. The other very important thing is, you know, we have some uh, uh, 5,100 species of modern placental, and we have some 300 species of marsupial. These two groups together makes up 99.9% .9 of all modern mammals. So we want to understand how this modern mammal start to diversify from this early ancestors. The well-preserved fossil from this early group, therefore, is very important for paleontology, very informative for, our, for us to infer how this diversification of evolution happened. Okay? So I'll give you one example to look at the ugly middle fingers. Okay? And this middle finger is very important, very informative. Okay? And uh, this, uh, it turns out that um, the earliest uh, marsupial relative and the earliest placental relative are very different in their wrist. In marsupial, several bones, forget about names, but look at the size, you can tell that they're huge. They're relatively massive, okay? And whereas in, in placentals, they are fairly small, so that's one thing that helps us to sort out their lineage belongings, okay? The other very interesting aspect is, is this, okay? Let me back step to give you an example of a modern family. Uh, these are uh, opossums, and this is a very common marsupial family in South America, one species gets to North America, but they are not here in Asia, okay? But this is a very well understood group, okay? And uh, in the opossums, we can have tree living opossums, okay? And uh, see, for example, these two guys are tree living opossums, and uh, this guy is a terrestrial opossum, and that is vast majority of the time it's bound to the ground, it's active on the ground surface. And among the terrestrial opossums, a few of them can actually swim, okay? It turns out this very different ecological specialization, either you are a swimmer, you are a ground runner, or you are a tree climber, are all different by your finger proportions. So it's just as simple as the longer the finger, more you are capable to grasp, more you're capable of grasping, and then you have a better chance to live in the tree, okay? But if you happen to be a digger, 
your finger proportion to be very small. And if you constantly live on the ground surface, you are somewhere in the middle. Okay? And this is how we understand it. Okay? If we now this is a complicated diagram for your non-science majors, but just bear with me. You should be able to understand it. Okay? And this bone here is called metacarpal bone. It's our hand bone. Form the palm of our hand is this axis. We calculate its percentage. Okay? This finger bone is called proximal phalanx. It's this, this segment. Okay? This is from this axis. And then we have the next segment, which is this axis. It turns out we should be able to distinguish uh, the ground living or the terrestrial opossums from the tree living arboreal opossums just by the finger proportions. You know, if we happen to have a very well preserved fossilized hand from some mammal, we should be able to make some inference about how this animal actually lived, right? Okay, so we have a whole series of mammals from Yixian, okay? The primitive mammals turns out to be uh, roughly more likely to be terrestrial, okay? But uh, the derived mammals that can be either tied to the marsupial lineage or placental lineage are most likely arboreal mammals. That is, the rise of this ancestor that eventually gave rise to 99.9% .9 of all modern mammals actually had a lucky break because they happen to be better specialized in getting on the tree. All right? So this is the kind of stuff that paleontologists are interested in, okay? But there are some popular stories associated with this, okay? We have this stereotype largely based on lack of scientific information of the last 150 years, which is this, okay? And uh, in the Mesozoic time, the world was ruled by dinosaurs because the dinosaurs were so dominant, therefore, early mammals are restricted to a very generalized terrestrial insectivore adaptation. They cannot diversify because dinosaurs competitively excluded them from many possible roles in the ecosystem. Okay, that was an old story. And then after dinosaur went extinct for some other reason, and then mammals diversified into a uh, semi-aquatic lineage, into a uh, uh, carnivore lineage, into the tongue feeding and eater lineage, into the climbing lineage, and into gliding and even power flying lineage. So that was the old story. Uh, we had, okay, and uh, the idea was mammals failed to diversify because dinosaur pushed them into this very narrow adaptation, okay? Well, that was then, before 1993. I'm glad to be a part of this game to really broaden the horizon of our knowledge about this mammalian evolutionary pattern, okay? In 2000, 2006, we start to discover semi-aquatic mammals. For example, this beaver-like mammal from Dogugo, okay? And in uh, 2005, the IVPP team actually discovered a very large mammal that swallowed a baby tetacosaurus dinosaur in the stomach, and two get fossilized together. Basically, besides the cute story, mammals can eat dinosaur too. The important message is that mammals actually managed to get into this carnivore adaptation, which was unknown prior to that discovery. Okay? So we can have carnivores, we can have scavengers, and then in 2005, uh, my colleague, John Weibel and me, discovered a form that can actually use the tongue to feed the ants or, or to feed a termite mound 
And essentially, this is a highly specialized form of adaptation known for aardvarks, for uh, pangolins, for echidna, and also in North America, especially for southern part of the United States, and much of the southern America, we have armadillos. Okay. And this was not known before, but now we have a fossil in the Jurassic that represents that ecological adaptation. Okay. And uh, say, for example, we also discussed that uh, Juromaya and many other early mammals can actually climb the tree. And once you climb on the tree, it's only a short jump away to glide. Okay. And the Mengjin's team with IVPP actually discovered one of the gliding mammals and made the cover of nature. Okay. So what we help to uh, 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 unveil through the study of this Chinese fossil is this mesozoic mammal really was ecologically very diverse. And it's an entirely different story from some time ago. Okay. Well, so what can our Jurassic mothers tell us in this fossilized roadkill flat fossils? Okay. And we can definitely, with the early mammals, we can pin down that uh, origin of fur hair. And also, typical mammalian integumentary structure is much more ancient evolutionary event than the origin of modern mammals. It's a big deal for me, okay? And we can also understand that sometime in the early Jurassic, about 190 to 200 million years ago, mammalian evolution take a very interesting turn so that our growth pattern change, possibly associated with the rise of lactation, because we get to study the dental replacement of some of those early mammals. Okay. We also understand some of this early Jurassic mammal actually experimented with very large brain as a function of design. So very early on, some of them had very large brains. Okay. And from the study of these major mammals, we understand the three extant or modern mammal lineages, placentals, marsupials, and monotreme, split sometime in middle Jurassic, no later than that. And then all these Mesozoic mammals have some degree of ecological diversification. So with that, that's my story about the fossil mammals from the Jurassic of China. Thank you.